Galil. This is a really, really cool weapon. This is the uh, original version of the, uh, the full-size Galil, uh, which was designed by Israel Galil in the 19... It was designed in the 1960s, but actually only went into production in the 1970s, uh, shortly before the Yom Kippur War. But during, even by the time of the Yom Kippur War, October 1973, only a very small handful of these were actually in production. Were actually in, in the field, so almost none of them saw service. Um, at that time, they were still using mainly the FN Fal uh, as the standard battle rifle, the Uzi, and even a whole bunch of Mauser 98Ks. Yeah. The weapon actually only became standard in the IDF, only uh, managed to produce enough by the mid 70s. Um, and it was uh, very well regarded. And it was by the time of the Lebanon War, which started in, up in 1982, this was the standard weapon, which almost all the soldiers that went into Lebanon were issued uh, the Galil. Um, and it was very, very effective. I mean, it was designed on the platform of the Valmet. Uh, the Valmet, which is the, the Finnish, more advanced version of the AK. Uh, so the reason that the IDF decided to design this was because uh, of the lessons learned in the Six Day War. The Six Day War, they were armed with FN Fals, which, uh, which is a good weapon, but it was very uh, susceptible to dirt and grime, and it would jam up a lot when they were using it in the Sinai Desert, there was a lot of, a lot of dust and, and, and sand. And so they decided to, uh, to develop a, 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 a weapon which was better for those conditions because the, the Egyptians that they were fighting had AKs and those AKs were, were holding up really nicely in, uh, in those conditions. Um, and they wanted to use, they, they liked the AK and the IDF actually used a lot of AKs. They captured huge amounts of AKs and they were using them very effectively. But they wanted to design something uh, indigenous which was more effective, the AK round, uh, not the greatest round, 7.62 by 39. They wanted, they liked the M16 round, which was the 5.56, and they wanted to develop some more features. They wanted a more accurate weapon. They wanted a weapon with a bipod. They wanted better sights because those open sights on the AKs are infamously bad. They wanted a better, you know, folding stock. This was actually taken from the FN Fal, not from the uh, the Valmet. And they wanted an ambidextrous type selector switch. So they got you got your AK style over here. And then you also got, you know, M16 style that you can just use the uh, thumb for over here. So there's a, a lot of uh, advances on this weapon. So this is really uh, an awesome weapon. So uh, let, let's talk about the parts and function of it. So of course we got our, we got our pistol grip over here. Again, five fingers on the pistol grip. We got our trigger, trigger guard. We got our uh, mag release, which is on this one over here. Unlike on the, uh, the AR platform, which the mag release is over there, this is more of an AK style mag release, although a, a more advanced type. So the magazine, again, clicks in from the front like an AK, unlike with the AR, which is just straight up. So you lock it in like that, and then you can actually release it two ways. Either, this is the, one of the advances over the AK, you can push in with your index finger, and it'll come out like that, or you can do it old school, the way the Russians developed it, for use with the left hand, removing the magazine like that. Charging handle above here. And this was another advancement over the AK. AK's charging handle was straight out. So the, the way the Russians it, it wanted to do it was you're gonna take your right hand off the gun and you're basically gonna charge it like that. The problem is it's not very tactical. It's not a good idea to ever take your firing hand off the weapon. So you never wanna do that. So the Israelis developed an upward facing charging handle so that you can take your left hand and cock it like that. So that was a revolutionary design. Um, the reason they had that in mind is because they had at that point been issued the fouls, and the fouls, if you all know, the foul was one of the first left-hand charging mechanisms, charging from the left. And that's much more effective because again, you never have to take your right hand off the weapon. So uh, it's got a great, really solid folding stock here, which by the way, should be able to knock with your, your shoulder. There you go, that's how you, because a lot of people don't realize, they think they, they try to close it by pushing down and then twisting. But in the IDF, we'd never do that. IDF, just give it a tap on the shoulder like that. It's not going to be shot from uh, folded? Position. You can, yeah, you can shoot this from the folded. Not that that's, you know, it's like an 80s movie kind of thing, ba 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 bum. But it's, it's not very effective. But yes, uh, you could if you had to shoot it from the folded position. This was mainly, actually, the IDF, we were required to have the stock open at all times, unless you're in a vehicle. The only exception that you would be allowed to close it was if you were in the confines of a vehicle. All right. Um, so we've got over here a kind of interesting hand guard made of wood, which is made to include your bipod here. This is an interesting bipod. This is a little different than the ones I remember. They didn't have this piece over here, but this is the bipod itself is, is, is really cool. Um, there's not a lot of people know there's actually a wire cutter in here. So you can actually use this. You put that on the wire and take the bipod and it'll go like that. Uh, it's also designed uh, 
to open Coke cans because the Israelis were using Uzi magazines to open Coke cans, not Coke cans, Coke bottles, the glass oh, yeah. bottles. And so they, so instead now you could use, you could use this system to pop open the, the, the Coke bottles, which is actually an interesting historical fact that a lot of people, lot of people are aware of. Uh, we got our barrel, of course, uh, bayonet lug, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these, most of them were not issued with the bayonet lugs. Uh, some of them were. This one is the aftermarket bayonet lug. Um, we got our flash hider, which was designed uh, upon the early M16 birdcage flash hiders, which were, you had your slits all the way around, as opposed to the newer ones, which are flat on the bottom. Uh, if you look at the M4 style flash hider, you only got your slits on top. The reason being, if you're firing over like a dirt hill, it, it'll cause a puff of dirt to puff up. So. Uh, in combat, if you want to avoid that, you have to pour out water on the dirt, which could waste water that you desperately need for drinking. Um, so that's sort of like a newer advancement. These older ones just don't have that, but it's still a very effective flash hider system. Very solid. Uh, we got our front sight over here and our rear sight. So this is one of the advancements over the AK here is that you have a very wide sight picture, meaning the, the distance from one sight to the next is very long. The longer you have as a rule in, 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 from one sight to the next, the more accurate your sights are going to be. So that's number one, because the AK sights are sitting just about up here, all right? So you have a very short sight picture. So that lowers your accuracy. And another problem being, again, that the open sights, like the pistol type sights, are, are not, they're not very uh, accurate. Uh, th these are designed on the platform of the GI sights, M16 type GI sights, but they're much more rugged. Um, and they're, they're very accurate. So you got two positions over here. If I recall correctly, yep, it's in there. You got a five. So the five relates to 500 meters. Okay, even though, again, this weapon is accurate to above 500 meters, uh, the IDF decided to be a little bit modest and said, okay, we're gonna shoot only to 500 meters. So, so if you notice, it's a little, it's a smaller people, kind of like on the AR-15s. Uh, the, the newer sites, they have a, a wider, uh, a wider peephole over here for, I think, up to uh, 200. I guess they use meters also, and they have a smaller one for above 200. Uh, whereas on the Galil here, you have the one for the 500, and then you have the one for the, uh, I think it's a two. Is it a two or is it a three? It's a three. Okay, 300 meters. So uh, we, were, we were zeroing these in to 250 or 300 meters. This was the standard. Like you weren't going to be using this for 500 for the most part. You were using this mostly for the, the, the 300, 250, and then you'd be shooting that um, at, you know, usually targets that were closer range than that, but this was still effective at that range. Now the cool thing you had over here, you had these flip up uh, tritium, let's see, uh, tritium looks dead here, uh, and the front tritium sight seems to be missing on this one, but imagine a little flip sight that comes up, these are night sights. So um, what that would do is they're, they're much thicker. Because at night, your, your, your vision is... What? It's thicker or it's low in the dark? It, it's both. It's, it's a larger sight. If you look how, how thick this thing is, it's a larger sight, right? So it's, it's, it's thicker. You're not going to be able to look through a peephole and see accurately at night. This thing allows you to shoot accurately at night. It's more similar. It's, it's like an open sight. Okay? It's more, it's, it's, it's more rudimentary. But that would be because you can engage that. And you can actually see pretty well at night. Um, so we would be using those uh, during the nighttime. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a pretty effective system, but the problem is almost all of the ones you have out there today, the tritium has died.